Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, hey, good morning, 10 o'clockers. How are y'all? Good. Y'all have figured out this is the best service, right? That's right. 10 o'clock. Yeah. So don't tell the other services I said that. But hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and uh, I'm honored to serve under our amazing senior pastors and also some of my favorite people, Marcus and Natalie Apolos. So we are continuing our series today in Philippians. The Summer of Joy is based on the book of Philippians. We're literally going through Philippians verse by verse, looking at what Paul had to say about joy. Paul wrote this book from a prison cell, and uh, amazingly, it's a book about joy. It's a The basic message of it is you can find joy no matter what your circumstances are. Real quick before we jump into the message, we have a team leaving tomorrow from this church. They're going to be going to Honduras to be working with youth in Honduras. So you got, yep, that's right. Uh, Pray for them this week. Pray for Brandy, their fearless leader. Um, So she's... She's, she's an old pro at this, right? You know, so as, as old of a pro as you can be at 19, how old is she, 20, something like that? So yeah, 24. Oh, sorry. You're an old pro. You're good. All right. Everybody's going to, everything's going to be fine, but pray for them anyway. So uh, they'll be leaving tomorrow. Also, if you want to give towards the project there, any money that comes in, we're just going to give it to the missionary there and be like, bless people with it. So your money will literally go straight to the missionary. So uh, if you want to give through the box back there, you can give online. Just de- put designate Honduras on it. So cool. All right. So about when I was in my mid thirties, I started realizing I was probably going to be doing this speaking thing a lot. Um, as much as I ran, I'm a pastor's kid. As much as I ran from being a pastor, it seemed to be hunting me down. So I was like, all right, I better figure out how to do the speaking thing. So uh, I started, you know, kind of studying speaking, and I got an opportunity to lead a six-week Bible study. And I got this group of guys, and we're leading this Bible study, and I decided to do it on the topic of pursuing your dreams. And I used the story of Joseph, Joseph from Genesis, you know, the Joseph that his brothers threw him in a pit, and then he got sold into slavery. And I, talk, I did a six-week series on, like, what to do when God's given you a dream for your future. And uh, it was a great series. And there was one guy who was there every week, all six weeks of it, which I was totally impressed with. At the end of the series, he came up to me and he's like, Joel, that was incredible. I just have a question. What do you do if you can't remember your dreams when you wake up in the morning? <laughs> and I was like, uh, well, I was talking about like dreams for the future, like, you know, vision and dreams, hopes and dreams you have for the future. And he's like, oh gosh, that makes everything make way more sense now. Okay. And I was like, I walked away going, I must be the world's worst communicator. Did not even realize how that was going to cross, come across. So I started thinking, okay, I've got to make sure that when I share something, I think about different ways people could take stuff. If I use a word that maybe you don't understand, so I'm going to get really clear about what words to use. So I started speaking regularly and I ended up speaking at this church down in South Texas. And at the end of the service, you know, I'd been focused. I'm like, I'm going to be really, really clear on this message. And uh, a guy came up to me uh, from the church staff and he's like, hey, uh, somebody dropped this in the offering for you. And I was like, oh, sweet. This may give me some money. Nope. It was an offering envelope. And it said, a great job guest speaker, but you don't turn left when you speak. I was like, what kind of a jerk writes that to the guest speaker? Like, what the heck? So I, I was like, well, Maybe he's, maybe he's on to something. So I started watching videos of myself, which is a miserable and painful thing to do. If you've ever watched yourself on video or listened to yourself on audio, you're like, Ugh. and I was like, I don't, I don't look, I'm like, I was like Zoolander. I'm, I'm not an ambi turner, right? I just, I don't. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. It's a movie reference. Uh, I don't turn left. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to work on that. So I started really getting intentional. I'm like, all right, I got to be really clear. And then I got to make sure I look to the right and I look to the left when I'm speaking. I got to make sure I hit everybody. So I'm working on that, right? Well, I get invited to speak at this big conference. It's in this huge arena. And uh, I get up there to speak. It's kind of overwhelming in this arena, but they had this stage that literally the stage was like the size of this building. So I'm excited. I'm getting up there speaking. I'm like, all right, I'm going to be really clear. I'm going to look to the left and the right. So I'm moving over here to the right, talking to these people. And then I'm moving over here to the left, talking to these people. And after I get off the stage, uh, this guy comes up to me and he's like, hey, I'm a speech coach. And that was a nine out of a 10. And I was like, thank you, I guess, nine out of a 10. He's like, you want to know how to make it a 10? I said, yeah. And he goes, you got to stop moving so much, man. <laughs> 
He said, you already talk too fast, which our brain can tolerate that if you didn't move so much, but we can't tolerate you like running all over the place. So he's like, you got to pick a place and stand in the middle and then talk to, you know, talk to the right and left. He's like, and then you can get away with talking fast. And I was like, all right. So all these people are just unsolicited. Like I did not ask for their opinion on my talk. They just felt the need to share this with me. So I'm going along. I'm getting, I feel like I'm getting this thing down. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm staying in one place. I'm talking. I'm learning how to do this stuff. And a friend of mine one day, I was talking to him. I was like, hey, what do you think of, you know, my, my, am I getting better? And he's like, well, yeah. He's like, just, you, you're just too intense, man. I can't listen to you for very long. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah. It's like, you talk about heavy stuff. He's like, you need to lighten it up a little bit, man. So I asked my wife. She's like, yeah, I, I agree. It's really intense. She's like, she said, yeah, but you got to line up. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to bring some humor into my talks. So I actually got a book about comedy, which my wife thought was ridiculous. She's like, you can't learn how to be funny. I was like, watch, watch and learn. I'm going to learn how to learn. So I'm reading this book. I started incorporating a little more humor into my talks. And I'm like, all right, I think I got this down. I'm, you know, I'm standing here. I'm doing the making clear, blah, blah, blah. A few weeks ago, I get a message. Sunday night, I'm just minding my own business. I get this angry message from somebody that said, you joke too much. You've turned the church into a comedy club. He says, I can't respect you. And I was like, what the, who is this guy? Like, what, what's going on here? So, but I got mad at first. And pro tip, if you ever have an issue with a pastor, um, do not bring it to him on Sunday if you want to be heard. <laughs> Just a pro tip, all right? I know it's convenient for you on Sunday, and that's when you're mad. But save it for Wednesday, okay? Just a pro tip if you want to be heard. So, uh, I'm like, what the heck? Like, who is this person? Didn't even know who the person was. But I thought, okay, is it, am I getting, like, am I making too many jokes in church? I'm, I'm evaluating it, you know? And my conclusion I came to is I was like, man, you don't survive as long as I have in the church without having a good sense of humor. So I'm like, I'm going to stick with my jokes. And if people get offended, stay la vie, whatever. Uh, because here's, here's the thing about church, y'all. If you haven't figured this out, you people be crazy. <laughs> Christians are nuts. Even the ones that have been Christians for a long time, some of them are the weirdest ones. Like, and sometimes, man, Christians will get all mad and they think they got the Holy Ghost behind them, but they're like acting like a rabid raccoon, right? They get crazy, man, and they come at you and they're like, yeah, oh, I got holy. And you're like, no, you're just angry. That's not the Holy Ghost, right? So anyways, my point with this is I have been trying and trying to get better at speaking, right? And I've been trying to get better at it, but, but every time I think I'm there, I have to make an adjustment because somebody calls me out and says, ah, you got off track a little bit here. And here's what I know about everybody in this room. You've got an area of your life that you're trying to get better in. You're trying to up your game. Maybe you're a dad and you're like, all right, I'm going to do this father thing. I'm going to get better at this. And I'm going to connect with my daughter. Like ever since she turned 13, that teen number, like I just don't understand my kid. Like I, I don't, I have to leave everything to my wife, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to try and be a dad. But every time you try and talk to your daughter, it just frustrates you. are like, how can she think that way? Like what's wrong with her? And then your wife calls you out and she's like, hey, you're not being a good dad. And you're like, oh, oh you know, and you're like, okay, all right. And she got to swing back in and try and correct yourself, right? Some of you, your moms, you got young kids. God bless you. You're like, all right, I'm not going to get mad this week. I'm not going to get mad when they do that thing. Right? No voy a tirar la chancla esta vez. So they get, and you're like, all right. And then they do the thing. And you're like, Aah! and you want to just strangle them. You're like, I love them so much. But man, I brought them into the earth and I can take them out. Right? <laughs> and you get frustrated because they do that thing and they're so rebellious. And you're like, ah, and you're like, but I'm not going to get mad. And then you like, realize after you got mad, you, they go to bed and they're like sweet laying there as angels. And you're like, oh, I shouldn't have got so mad, you know, and. And you're like, ah, oh, and you correct yourself, right? And uh, maybe for you, it's, you know, you're trying to break a habit. Maybe you're drinking too much, right? You know you're drinking too much. People have been calling you out on You're like, oh, I'm not, not going to drink so much. And then you find yourself Sunday night, had a little bit too much to drink. You're sending mean messages to Joel. And, <laughs> and it happens, right? And we, we find ourselves, people correct us. We correct ourselves. And we're just, but here's the hard the thing. It's really easy to get super down on yourself. And you just go, man, I give up. I can never get this down. But here's my point this morning. The hardest, most, the most important things in life are going to be the hardest, right? The, the important things are really hard to do. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, okay? 
But, but here's my point with that. Most of the greatest challenges in life aren't problems to be solved. They're tension points to be managed. We wish we could just go, all right, I got this part of my life fixed. I'm good at this now. I don't have to work on it. But you think, just when you think you got it down, something comes in and a curveball gets thrown and you're like, ah, and somebody calls you out or you call yourself out or you feel guilty about it because you're like, I didn't get it right. My wife, when I was trying to explain this, she's like, it's not, it's not very clear. So I listened to my wife. So when I said it this way, she got it. She said, there's no autopilot in the Christian life. I took a sailing trip a few years ago with a bunch of guys and my buddy took his boat and we sailed from Key West down to the Dry Tortugas Islands. And he put the boat on autopilot, but he said, you stay here at the helm. And I was like, why? It's on autopilot. He's like, it doesn't matter if it's on autopilot. He says, because the currents can push it so hard off that you actually have to correct it before the autopilot can correct it. He also said, there's going to be stuff that there's, there's, we're in some really shallow water. And he's like, if you're not watching the depth meter, you could bottom out the boat. It's like, there may be logs in the way that the autopilot can't see. You've got to be watching ahead. There's no autopilot in life. You're constantly having to course correct. And that can be frustrating for us because we just want to get it set and go on autopilot. But we don't have that luxury because we're constantly struggling with this tension of life in life of who we are right now versus who we believe we want to believe that we could be. And what's even more challenging is we're struggling with who we are and what God says we could be. And it's not a problem to be solved. It's a tension point to be managed. So we're constantly having to self-correct. And you think you got it down over here, and then somebody calls you out, and you're like, all right, and you get back on track. And that is part of the journey of life. So Paul's talking about this. We're picking up in Philippians today, where he says this. He says, guys, dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, He says something weird, okay? He says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, this verse, in my humble opinion, is probably the most important verse in the entire book of Philippians. It's so important that Pastor Marcus and I have decided we're going to actually spend two weeks covering it, okay? So I'm going to set it up this morning. We're going to look specifically at this. First of all, work out your salvation. What does that mean? Because if you've been in church a while, you know, it's not by anything good, any of your works you've done that you get in the gate in he- to, to salvation. It's all because Jesus came and paid the price you couldn't pay yourself. On your best day, you could not be good enough to get into heaven. And God knew that. So he sent his son Jesus and he said, Jesus is going to pay the price. And if you accept his gift, you're in the gate. Your sins are forgiven. So he's not talking about working towards your salvation. What he's talking about is this process of salvation. And you go, process of salvation? I thought salvation was a one and done deal. Well, salvation has three elements to it, okay? This is, there's going to be some theological terms. Don't get too hung up on the terms. Focus on the, the, the theme here, all right? There's three specific processes in the salvation process. The first is justification, okay? Justification is the one-time deal. The moment you confess that you don't have what it takes to get to heaven and you depend completely on Jesus to get all of your sins forgiven, you are justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned in God's eyes. Paul talks about that at the start of the book. He says, you guys, you're saints. And you go, what? I'm not a saint? And he says, yeah, you are. In God's eyes, you're a saint. And we talked about this the first week that you don't do good works to become a saint. You do good works because you already are a saint in God's eyes. It's a whole different way of looking at things. God already approves of you because you've been justified. So this verse comes in, says this, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. As soon as you accept his gift, your sins are forgiven. God is not mad at you. Your sins are forgiven. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It says through him, we've also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand right now. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's the first step, justification. If you've accepted Christ, you've jumped up to the next stage. And this is the fun, not so fun part. Sanctification. This is the stage where God says, I'm going to take everything you are and I'm going to get it in line with what you could be. I'm going to push you to become all you could be. And this is the hard part. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians, it says this. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit 
and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's talking about here is the sanctification process. Because when you accept Christ, it says your spirit comes alive. It says you were dead in your sins and trespasses. But when you accept Christ, your spirit comes alive. The spirit is the deepest part of who you are. That's the part that's going to live on forever. And then it says, but also let your soul be sanctified. And your soul is made up. The Greek word soul is suke, which is where we get our word psychology from. And the Greek word psychology encompasses your thoughts, your desires, and your emotions. And how many of you know that's the hardest thing to get in line? Because we've all got mindsets, mental blocks. We just can't get over stuff we learned growing up that's not even right. And you just can't get over it. Like, well, there's no way it could be that way. And people are saying, no, you're wrong about the way you see the world. No, the way I see the world is the right way. And the Proverbs, it says, every man's way seems right in his own eyes. Until somebody tells you you're not right. And you go, well, I don't like that. Yeah, but it's the reality of the situation. So we have to get our thoughts in line. We have to get our emotions in line. How many know that's hard? Every Monday morning, I wake up and I feel like God has fallen off the throne. Because I feel down and depressed. It has nothing to do with God. He's still up there raining on high. Everything's good. But I feel down and discouraged. And so the world's bad. And I'm like, oh, God, have you forgotten me? He's like, Joel, pull yourself together. It's, you're just having an emotional day, right? And we have to get the emotions in line. And God's saying, you got to get your emotions in line to where you're not swayed by every emotion that comes because your emotions will lie to you. And that's a hard thing for some of us. And then the other part, you got your thoughts, your emotions, and your desires. And how many of you know, man, getting those desires in line with what God wants for you is really hard too. The stuff we want, sometimes it just destroys us. And we know it's destroying us. You're trying to quit that bad habit because you know it's bad for you, but just like, but I want it. God's like, it's not good for you. Yeah, but I want it. He's like, it's not good. And that's the struggle. And that's where we're at constantly, where we're constantly going, all right, I think I got this under control. And then right when you think you got that under control, God's like, all right, now we're going to work on this over here. And you're like, come on. Does it never end? He's always making me work more on myself. But here's the good news. You're going to come to a point, and this is the final step in it. It's glorification. This is the moment. I love this verse. It says, beloved, this is John's writing. He says, beloved, we're God's children right now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. He's saying right now, You're God's child. And I know you mess up, right? You know you mess up. You know you, I know me. We know we mess up over and over again. But it doesn't take you away from being God's child. But he's saying this, he's saying, but what you could be, you have no idea. God sees what you could be. And that's why he keeps pushing you to be more than you are right now. But it gets tiring and tiresome because sometimes we're like, I just don't want it. The change is hard and I don't like it. God's like, I know, but I got big plans for you. And I see greater things in you than you even see in yourself. And the beautiful thing is there's going to come a day when Jesus shows up again, the second coming, or you go to meet him first through passing away. But in that moment, there's this glorified moment where, it's, where your body's going to be completely sanctified. He's going to give you, it says he's going to give you a new body. And all of a sudden, your spirit Your soul and your body will all be in alignment with what God intends for you. It's going to be a great day. But right now, we're in the throes of the battle, the sanctification struggle. And unfortunately, we're all unsanctified Christians, which is why you can have Christians that are just kind of hard to deal with sometimes. Because we're all in different processes of growing. And that's what's so hard about being in a church. You have some people who are like, well, they should know better. Yeah, they should know better. They've been hanging out here for 30 years, but they still got the issue. And you got an issue too. God's working on you. He's working on them. So deal with it and have some grace for one another. Amen. And this is where Paul picks up here. He says, now, I want you to work out your salvation. Working it out is this sanctification process, becoming all you could be. But he says, I want you to work it out with fear and trembling. Now you go, wait, fear and trembling? They're like, do we need to be afraid of God? Listen, fear is a good thing, right? But when they're talking about fear of God, it's not fear that he's going to condemn you because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It's this fear. What I think he's talking about here, fear and trembling, is this idea. It's a healthy reverence for the fact that God expects something from you. He didn't save you just so you could sit on your blessed assurance. That's an old Christianese thing. I vowed to never say it, and I just did it. Anyway, 
He didn't say if you could just say, oh, I'm saved, everything's good. No, he says now you have the capacity because the Spirit of God is living in you. Now you have the capacity to become all I say you could be. So rise up and become all you can be and don't give up when it gets hard because it's going to be hard. And if it was, every, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. It's going to be challenging, but it's his power that's going to strengthen you to do it. But the fear is this, man. The worst thing that could happen is for you to not achieve all that God says you could be. Because our goal is when we stand before him, we want him to say, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. You fought the good fight. You finished the race. Come on in to your eternal rest. That's one part of the fear. Another part of the fear is this, and trembling is this. It's a deep humility that realizing we never arrive in this life. The moment you think you've got it down, he's going to show you another area you can work on. So it keeps you humble, right? When I get called out for something, I go, all right, maybe they're right. Maybe there's something I need to listen to. But let me, let me make this really important point. You're never going to get where God wants you to be by comparing yourself to other people. Because we're all on a very specific journey. If I compare myself to you, I'm going to be frustrated. If you compare yourself to me, you're going to be frustrated. Because you've got a specific journey. You've got specific things God's working out in you. I got specific things God's working out in me. The only person you should compare yourself to is the person you were yesterday. Have you improved since yesterday? And the most important thing is you're comparing yourself to have I become more like Christ. The ultimate judge is have I become more loving like Christ is. And here, here's the, the really great thing about this. I think this is a beautiful I think it's a beautiful truth because it gives us a lot of grace for ourselves. Because you know you fall short all the time. I fall short all the time. I get angry. I get frustrated. I get discouraged. I get anxious. And I know I'm not supposed to be all those things, but I still do it. But there's this, this realization that, you know what? God's using these things to make me who he wants me to be. And if I stay humble and realize I haven't arrived, but that's okay, God has grace for me. We sang, it's your breath in our lungs. You know, in Genesis 2, 7, it says, God breathed breath into the man that he had made from dirt. And my dad used to always tell me, he's like, hey, don't worry. God knows the raw material he's working with. You're just dirt. <laughs> That's why he's gracious with us, right? He's gracious. And you need to be a little bit kinder to yourself from time to time because some of you, you're, such, you're so hard on yourself. And listen, you never compromise. You never settle. But you also need to remember, man, God's grace is what's going to get you through. So you need to have a little grace for yourself when you don't live up to your own standards. But don't ever give up. Because here's my final point. You only fail if you quit. In this process that you're going through right now, it hurts. It's uncomfortable. God keeps squeezing stuff out of you. You're like, I thought we were done with this. And he's like, nah, there's way more I got for you. And you're like, I don't like this. And he's like, I know, but it's going to be good for you in the end. And every little bit he squeezes out of you, he's making you better and more and more who he knows you could be. And the only way you fail is if you quit. That's right. And you say, I can't do this anymore. And, and, and listen, you can't do this. But Christ in you is the one who's going to give you the power to do this. So tomorrow morning, when you feel this strong desire to pull up the chancla and throw it across the room, Take a deep breath. Say, Lord, I know you're using these kids to sanctify me. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> when your husband ticks you off, when your wife ticks you off, when your teenage daughter ticks you off, you go, thank you, Jesus. I'm being sanctified. <laughs> and you give thanks to the Lord because, man, he's pulling something out of you you don't even see in yourself. And he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So trust the process and don't give up. Stay in the fight. Let's not grow weary in doing good for you will reap a harvest at the right time if you don't give up. Stay in it. He's working through all the stuff you're going through right now. Even though it feels like sometimes he's abandoned you, he hasn't abandoned you. He's working right through the middle of all of those struggles. You guys receive that? Yes. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that you are the one who's working in us to will and to act according to your good pleasure. So I pray for those that right now, man, they're feeling the crunch of life. Maybe they're feeling a habit that, that they just seem like they can't beat. Lord, I pray that today they would lean into you for the power to do that. You are sanctifying us. You are making us into glorious, amazing people that you, you intended us to be. So I pray for anyone this morning, Lord, whatever it's a relational challenge or whatever the challenge they're going through. Maybe it's their own sense of self-worth, Lord. 
I pray that you would just speak to them in a very unique way and remind them that you're in their corner, you're fighting for them, and they can depend on you for the strength they need to get through what, you've, what, what you're allowing them to go through to strengthen them. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Jesus. That's the first step by getting justified by God's grace. I'm going to say a prayer in a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to come and forgive all your sin. He's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up in eternity with him. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Man, hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you back there under the do it again sign. Man, you guys stay encouraged this week. Don't give up. Stay in the fight. There's good stuff ahead. Be blessed. You're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.